This is Evelyn. Man, I do, I do suck at the Doug DeMuro in introductions. This, 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 this. Let's just call it Eve for short. A true beauty, isn't she? Yeah, I know it needs some love here and there, but you can see it, right? <laughs> ah. I see, I must be missing something. Hmm, yeah, I guess context would be handy. So, it all started because I was bored and I had just begun working, which meant that for the first time in my life I had grown up money, and with grown up money come grown up hobbies. Hmm, maybe these are exaggerated. Well, let's just go back to the storyline that matters. Initially, I just wanted a M Mr. Bean's Mini for myself, so I just thought about the idea of finding one, give it some love, and get myself my first little classic car. Like this. Or this. Well, you get the gist. But then, because I clearly do not love my sleep, I just thought, why not convert it to electric while I'm at it? How hard can, can that possibly be? Like any person about to get into something that they only have a vague idea about, I started browsing for what I would need, like the electric motor, batteries, uh, controllers, the donor, car, other mixed renovation costs, and even certification. And when I saw the total price it was amounting to, I basically just jumped chip. Even if I wanted to stick to my first plan, I felt I didn't have enough experience, nor an appropriate place to start with. So. I shrank my plans both in size and scope, and I kept the idea of electrification in mind. So I thought, why not go for a motorcycle? It would be cheaper, easier to carry, and to work on. And what if I, I never rode a motorcycle before? Or at least a proper one, for that matter. That could be arranged, right? Well, maybe, maybe just a problem for future me. I don't even want to get started on how expensive it will be to get my license here in, in Germany, so just let's leave that for a different rant. Well, anyways, that's why Eve exists. How it came to be is a different story. I knew I needed to set some direction, especially because motorcycles are not my strength. So I went for the basic cliche cafe racer type project. I browsed Google for possible donors and the K100 just seemed to pop out. Plus, all the forums I found said it, would, it could be taken apart with a couple 10mm wrenches and the respective Allen key, so it just seemed simple enough. Yeah, in some out of pure looks, I had chosen a donor, and I started looking for some options that required a bit of love, and shooting some messages on eBay. At least eBay small ads here in Germany. It took a while, but I finally got a hit on an ad for a K100 RS one hour away from my place. I found a friend here in Munich and we drove there that same weekend. I just fell in love with it, so I bought it right there and then. And I negotiated with the guy that was selling the transportation back to my apartment since we didn't even have a, a trailer with us. So for the low price of a thousand euro, I had my donor bike and that same day the guy delivered it to my garage, so that was it. I had my donor. So the K100, or the flying brick as it is also known, out of the fact that it has a four, um, a straight four cylinder engine, is just what BMW needed to get out of the slump of producing these flat twin boxer engines that came from 
early BMW days, so they needed to produce something that was a bit more sophisticated, and the K100 was the answer to this. In the early 1980s, BMW decided it needed a bike with more power than it could get from the classic two-cylinder air-cooled boxer engine. It decided to build a four-cylinder liquid-cooled engine, something the company had never done before. What a shock. The world had grown up with opposed twins, air-cooled, and all of a sudden, here comes this uh, rather industrial-looking liquid-cooled four-cylinder. In general, it also has some good numbers, so it, it at the time, they claimed 220 km per hour and uh, 90 horsepower, 90 PS, at 8,000 RPM. As for torque, 85.8 newton meter at 6,000 RPM, so not too shabby. And in general, this bike was produced between 1982 and 1992. My model in specific is from 1985. Well, hello and welcome again to Motor Week 89. We're glad to have you with us. If you're a regular viewer, you know our staff is quite taken with the products of the Bavarian Motor Works. They offer a combination of performance and luxury we find hard to resist. We recently spent some time with another kind of BMW, one that offers the same performance and prestige as a BMW car, but with only half as many wheels. By now, a few of our better informed viewers have realized we're talking about motorcycles. More specifically, the only motorcycle good enough to wear the BMW badge. Almost anyone can tell you that this is a BMW, but this is a BMW too. The one liter inline four cylinder of our test bike is also fuel injected, one of the few motorcycle engines that is. Its dual overhead cam design produces 82 horsepower. If you consider that low, remember it only has 534 pounds of motorcycle to move. It came in many models and actually in also different engine sizes, so the K100 per se was just a no fairing motorcycle, the K100C had a small cockpit fairing, the K100RS, the one I have, is, has sports fairings and lower handlebars, the K100RT is the full touring, has the full touring fairing, the K100LT, which just stands for luxury touring, has a higher screen and additional standard equipment, and the K100T I see was developed as a, an authorities vehicle, so basically police, ambulance, fire, military, and everything that comes with. Uh, but essentially, if you remove one of these cylinders, you make a litter bike be a 750cc bike. And that's how the K75 came to be, and the same model would apply it, generally. It was also one of the first bikes to actually have ABS features. Mine does not actually have it. And some of the versions, at least the earlier, had two valves per cylinder. Uh, the next ones actually have four valve. And in my case, I have the two valve, which doesn't really matter, right? Because the engine is not going to be used. I had no clue what to do next. So I decided to start small and just see what was under the fairings. My logic being, I don't need them anyway, since the motorcycle is going to be a cafe racer. And that's the first natural step, I guess. So by doing this, I started to develop a very nice defined idea of what needed a bit of love. The first obvious one was actually the fuel leaking out of the fuel tank. I guess not running the motorcycle for 10 years gets you something like this. And some of the paint was chipping away, the motorcycle was just full of gunk out of the fuel accumulating with all of the dirt that already was on it anyway. And I just figured I'm gonna use this fuel tank at best as a mold for a composite electronics enclosure. So not really, not a big problem anyway. The rear damper was toast. Again, this is something I saw straight away and I knew it needed replacing. I It's part of the reason why the motorcycle was so cheap. The front brakes didn't specifically work, which kind of made it a bit sketchy to go down the ramp in my garage. Uh, only difficult because of my low experience, I guess, because the rear brakes did work. Uh, so that's basically what saved me going down the, the ramp. And the front suspension was kind of soft and easy to compress, which I then came to learn it was just normal in, on these bikes. And the fork seals were kind of dried up because of the age and the elements, I guess. Also, for a guy that has not touched a motorcycle, a proper motorcycle for that matter, in his life, I couldn't help but just think are these supposed to be always this heavy? 
I weigh in at 70 kilograms, and for me it was a real struggle to put it on the center stand. I don't mean the, the normal stand, I mean the center stand that lifts the rear wheel. And I guess as additional information, I'm not really sure if this motorcycle has been involved in a crash. At least if it was so, it's not so evident. I knew a couple more things, actually, when I bought the motorcycle, because I talked to the seller and there was some documentation provided. So in general, I knew that last certification, last inspection papers were available were from around 10 years ago. So it's probably around the time when it last ran. Um, it has around 50,000 kilometers on the clock. It had a different exhaust than the stock one, but I got both and both were equally corroded and both are equally useless to me. I bought it with a different seat than stock and the same applies because I'm going to change it anyway. It had no ECU, so I guess somebody had must have sold it in small ads. And it had no battery, which I guess is to be expected for a bike that hasn't run in 10 to 12 years. And as I got to work on it, I just also got to understand how much weight it took to get this lo thing looking pretty. So in total it actually measured it up. So after using my highly scientific weight measuring device, I took 28 kilos in fairings and other parts like the odometer and and the seat. But in general taking the seat out of the equation because it will need a seat anyway, it's more than 20 kilos that I took out of in glass fiber, plastic and uh, oversized parts in general, steel, whatever. It was in there. Actually, you can see them all here. And I also removed four liters in total of oil from engine, transmission, rear hub, all of the things that I will need to actually open, crack open and see what, what the state of before I, I progress. In any case, even though I took so much weight out of it, I do realize that by wanting to make it electric, I'm gonna add up a lot of weight, just in battery, for instance. And my early estimations just say that I'm gonna probably need between 40 and 50 kilos in cells, plus the electric motor is going to be 7 kilo in my current expectation and the controller is around 3 to 5 kilo. Everything needs to be water cooled. So no matter how much weight I end up taking out of it, it is still a work in progress. And uh, don't even get me started on these things that I need to open. I, I'm not really sure what to do with the transmission. I already have an idea of which gear I want to keep to, to make this work, but I will actually reserve time to explain in a different video how I'm calculating what gear to keep and how I'm kind of doing the overall high level design of the powertrain and how I'm going to try to nail down smaller and smaller details until I actually get the, the full concept. But this is just the first part, this is just the first episode, the first chapter in the history of EVE. So if you liked what you've seen so far and you are intrigued by the concept, please do follow. I will keep pumping some videos on what I will be doing, why I will be doing so and maybe even some fun things on the side because I am a tool enthusiast, I am a tech enthusiast, I like everything that's tech related and I don't mean to sound vague I do really li like tech applied to vehicles my worry currently is related to uh, high-tech vehicles so guys just don't be shy if you liked what you've seen so far just leave me a like in the bottom it will help me and I know I'm just starting but if you are intrigued by the whole process don't forget to, to maybe subscribe because I intend to upload more stuff in the near future uh, I can promise you when because I'm also doing my own editing, but anyway, I will do my best. So see you next time